to invite you to turn with me to uh, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, the second chapter of Mark. We're going to read the first 12 verses. I'm uh, starting a little sermon series today. It's not long. It's just three messages. Uh, what's unusual about the me message series is it's going to be uh, on these 12 verses. We're going to preach a different message on these uh, 12 verses uh, each week, this, today, and the next two Sundays. And we're calling this uh, series, When Jesus is in the House, now let's read beginning in Mark chapter 2, verse 1. And again, Jesus came into Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. And that's, that's our message title for the series. He's in the house. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. And they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned this within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise, take up your bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all. So that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We've never seen anything like this before. I, I want to, uh, again, do a little short three-message uh, series uh, on when Jesus is in the house. Let me tell you what we mean when we say when Jesus is in the house. I understand in Mark 2, he was physically in the house. Uh, it's an unusual 33 and a half year uh, period here in the New Testament when God uh, took the form of a human body. In Jesus' day, if Jesus, uh, for example, if he lived in Loganville, if he was here at Summit, that many wouldn't be at First Baptist. That many wouldn't be at First Methodist. That many wouldn't be at First Atlanta uh, because he limited himself to being in one place. That's where he was. Uh, but, but I use it more of a symbol. We do this all the time. For example, you ever go to a service and you see somebody the next day who maybe couldn't be here and you say, man, God showed up. Well, theologically for the theologians, we understand God's everywhere. It's a figure of speech. Or uh, maybe you go to a youth camp and you say, man, I just, man, Jesus was there. Well, you know, I wouldn't look at that person and say, well, well theologically Jesus is everywhere. We know what they mean. And uh, I will tell you something that they're, they're, ought to be a goal of every church that Jesus would be in the house. Uh, I like symbols. Uh, it's a good thing because if you're in the New Testament, Jesus used a lot of symbols. For example, if he talked about witnessing, sometimes he'd say a farmer went out to sow, and he would, he would compare witnessing to sowing, or, and he used all kind of different uh, symbols or illustrations. This is a symbol that I used to use quite a bit uh, when I was on church staff. And I would say, whatever we do, we ought to have Jesus in the house. And I mean, because of that, we took a, a, a microscope and we looked from preschool ministry to senior adults. Uh, even as far to say, if a person is a church member and uh, they're a church member and they die while they're a church member, at their funeral, we want Jesus in the house. I never preach funerals uh, without telling people now, the gospel is going to be preached. And if that's ever a problem, never was. If it's a problem, uh, you don't need to preach it. Because we, we believe that we, and in fact, I thought this week, we had 36 point something acres of land. And I used to pray consistently. I mean, sometimes I'd be in the parking lot and I would pray, Lord, I, I want Jesus on every inch of this 36 acres. Now, we made no apologies. Uh, we had sports programs and other things. And we said this, if you own our piece of land, we're going to preach Jesus. When there's basketball games, there's a thing called halftime. Somebody's going to be there preaching Jesus. I don't like it. Go to the City League. Go to the YMCA. That, that, that's America. You've got that choice. 
we got the choice. It may not be this way 50 years from now. It may be illegal to do it. But we've got the choice at Summit to preach Jesus. We can shout Jesus on every inch of your 40 acres. Do you know that? Now, some of us would be mad if it became illegal to say amen in church. <laughs> Most of us, it shouldn't bother. We don't do it anyway. What does it make? And, and so we want Jesus. I'm going to tell you something. When Jesus gets in the house, folks will drive a long ways to it. Did you know that? A word, because what happens is when Jesus gets in the house, folks talk about Jesus, and they don't always even know they're talking about Jesus. They just go to work tomorrow, and, and, and just spontaneously they see somebody and say, man, you should have heard that solo yesterday. Man, Jesus was all over that. And what happens is, Time goes on, and, and somebody hears you, and they look at their wife or husband and say, you know, well, we got that new baby coming. We ought to get in church. We're we going to Summit. Why would we go to Summit? Oh, man, I tell you, every week, that's all I ever hear. Uh, one of the greatest church growth principles is when Jesus gets over everything you do. And so I want to look at this today. Uh, when Jesus is in the house, from this perspective, when Jesus is in the house, people will respond. When Jesus is in the house, people will respond. I, I've, I've stood before deacons before, and I've said, I know we don't baptize very many, not here, but other places. I know we don't baptize many. Come a day, it'll be unusual not to baptize. And some are, oh, yeah, don't, don't put too much pressure on yourself, Pastor. Don't do it. But you know, a year go by, and you baptize 35, 40 weeks in a row, and you miss two weeks, and you'll have deacons say, hey, what's, what, what's wrong? And, I, and this is true. I remember one time I told him, I said, ain't nothing wrong. That's bad grammar. Ain't nothing wrong. Something's good that you would say that me. You have an expectation. Yeah. We ought to baptize. You know why? Because when Jesus gets in the house, you just have an expectation, not because of us. Great things happen when Jesus is in the house. People respond when Jesus is in the house. Well, well let's look at this. First of all, uh, some... Some people will respond to his message. That's one reason they were there. Uh, the, uh, Mark is a fast-paced gospel. In fact, it happens in those verses we read. It uses the word immediately. If you use King James, it says straight away. Uh, it's only 16 chapters. I think about 48 or so times it uses the word immediately, straight away. It's a gospel of action. It, just, it, it doesn't give you a lot of unnecessary details. It just goes straight to it. Jesus did this, and, and instantly, and immediately, and straight away. Uh, here's what Jesus is a gospel with some urgency about it. So Jesus has been preaching, and he's become very well known. And of course, Mark, this is just chapter two, but this is the way Mark is. It just it, it don't take long to build up to Jesus doing things. And uh, word got around he was in the house, and they knew he was a God who could heal. That's why folks are bringing one of their friends. That they already know Jesus is able to heal people. Uh, people will respond. To his message. Uh, what was his message? Well, you don't have to turn, but in Mark chapter 1, verse 14, it says this. After John the Baptist was put in prison, and that shows you, by the way, you read the Bible a lot, that shows you how quick Mark is. This is Mark 1, verse 14, and John Baptist is already in prison. That just Mark doesn't waste time. He just gets straight to the point. Uh, there's nothing unnecessary. One reason is he's uh, proclaiming a certain aspect of Jesus to a, to a Gentile audience. So he's just trying to get straight to the point that, hey, this Jesus is the Savior of the world. After John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. You know why people respond to Jesus? Because the word gospel means good news. That's what's exciting about preaching. Uh, anytime you're preaching a New Testament message, it's good news. Now, I will say this. The Word of God is living, it's powerful, it convicts me. You know why it's good news? The Word of God may step into my neighborhood and say, your marriage is terrible. That's good news, you know why? Because that's never the end of the message. But it could be a great marriage. Your, your prayer life is non-existent. And boy, I'm convicted. But the good news is, but because of the grace of God, you can be a prayer warrior. Uh, the, the gospel says this, you lost, you're going to hell. I got good news for you. The gospel says not only you lost, Jesus paid the penalty. Come to Jesus if you want to come to Jesus. And so Jesus preached the gospel. And people responded. 
Let me put it in our, our language. Some of, you, some of you have been in these situations. Some, some have not, but it's great if you ever have. There was standing room only. You ever been in church where you said, what do we do? It's good problems. There's two problems in churches. There's dying problems and growing problems. You'd much rather have growing problems. Growing problems is our sanctuary is not big enough. What do we do? And sometimes we say, well, why don't we have an overflow room for a while? Why don't we grow a little bit more before we start that second service? Or you say, let's go ahead and start the second service. Uh, Jesus is preaching... And the building's not big enough to contain people. It is standing room only. Some people respond to his message in a positive way. You ever uh, take a class and they've got your name on a roll and they call the roll every time? Anybody's ever done that? And, you know, they start usually with A's and go down to wherever that last name would be. And so if I'm in there, Steve Foster, present or here. Well, what if we did that to Jesus? Uh, people respond to Jesus. Nicodemus, present. I was a lost Pharisee on my way to hell. But I met Jesus one night and he told me, think about this. I love the verse, most famous verse in the Bible. But Nicodemus actually heard it for the first time and audibly. For God so loved the world. I'm present. Uh, Zacchaeus present man i was up in a tree because i heard about jesus and i was a tax collector in that day meaning i made most of my living by roman empire wanted so much and i extorted as much as i could so i could make some money and jesus paused and didn't even have to think he just looked at him and said come down like this i never met the man before bartimaeus present i was blind and begging and jesus stopped and said what can i do for you i want my sight and Bartimaeus says looky here no glasses or contact 2020 vision i can see woman at the well are you present i'm here i i i i was drawing water at the time you don't draw water because i didn't want to be around the other women because i'm was immoral but jesus sat down roll call See, when Jesus gets in the house, I used to assume I was a pastor. I'd be preaching sometimes, and I'd look up, and I never said anything, because, you know, your mind thinks quicker than you speak. I'd look up, and I'd think, that old boy got saved when we in the, in the John series. I'd keep on preaching. i think, that old boy got saved when, when, when we preached a series in Revelation. Uh, that woman came to Jesus. Roll call! And if we had time today, hopefully, there may not be many, hopefully there's enough spirituality at some Some I could say, if you call the roll today, for Jesus, I could stand and tell you exactly where I was when Jesus called my name and how I responded. Whenever Jesus gets in the house, people respond. It's exciting. By the way, some folks will leave. You know why? Because they, like, they don't like happiness. They don't like joy. They don't like a full house. But from the positive side, when Jesus proclaims his message great things happen I, they, my wife can tell you anybody human can have some discouragement i don't i just not very discouraged people come to me all the time i know you have to be discouraged no you're discouraging you're, you're judging me by you're discouraged by, I, listen i had that happen within two or three weeks here if i'm discouraged within two weeks of being a summit i need a new job first of all i'm not discouraged because ain't none of my friends left here i don't know anybody here I'm not discouraged because, can I tell you, this is the gospel truth. Did you can tell you? My, my, my son will still make fun of me. I've got a basement in my house that's an office. It's not this big. I've got a little podium down there. If I go a couple of days without preaching, if I'm on vacation, I can't, I somehow get behind the podium and I start preaching. Why? I, 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 discourage. Now that I've already got it settled, the finance scene, I would have done this for free. I'm telling you, man, I'll tell you what. Discouraged. Let me show you how much I love preaching. This is, this is odd. In my car right now, I've got four messages on CD that is a tent crusade. It was like a 15,000 seat tent from Oral Roberts' early days of ministry. Now, if you like preaching enough that you listen to a dude preach from the 1960s, you like preaching. What, what I'm saying is, 
when you get in the presence of Jesus, I don't know about you, it's hard to be discouraged when you're gazing on Jesus. I don't know how some of you don't smile. I, I, don't, I just I don't get it because when you're gazing on Jesus, am I right? There's something about Jesus. It's not us, by the way. It's just, it's just him. A uh, second thing is, when Jesus is in the house, people are going to respond. Some people respond to his message. Some people, and I love that God does this, some people will respond with anger and indifference. You know why I love it? Because if God didn't show us this, you know why I would think? If God didn't go out of the way to tell me, son, put on your spiritual armor. Why? Because you're about to be attacked. All they who love, live God in Christ, you suffer persecution. I, I'm just saying, I would be so naive. I'm just saying, I, some of you would be, I would be. I'd be so naive, I'd get saved, and I would think, man, it ain't nothing but a, somebody rolled out the red carpet for me, and I'm going to skip through life, and it's just, a, it's just an awesome thing. And what God does is, he comes and says, let, let, me, let me shake that nonsense out of your head. Why? Because he loves me enough. But for example, you, you, you got a young child, or you got a, Say a child that, I say child because I'm old. You got a child that's a tenor's driving some. You, you don't tell them, be careful, strength. You don't tell them, be on the alert. You don't tell them, hey, in the day we live in, you go out in the parking lot. Kind of, kind of be aware of your surrounding. You don't say that because you're trying to scare them. You say it because you understand we live in a fallen world and bad things happen to good people. And Jesus says, put on the whole armor. And, and here in this passage, look at how some people respond. And, and I love this. You got some folks who are responding, they're so passionate, they're saying, we're going to get our friend to Jesus. And even that they showed up late. And the house is full, they could have said, hey, we tried, buddy, we tried the bed, what else could we do? They're so passionate with optimism, hey, oh, don't worry, friend, we'll take the dad burn roof off if we have to. We're we going to do what we need to do. And in the midst of it, some people respond with anger and indifference. Let's read it again, verse uh, 6. And some of the scribes were sitting there. Which, just let me say this, in case you don't catch it. What you do in sitting in a full room, the Greek phrase is, and this is the way they sit, they weren't really sitting the way we sit Western style. They were sitting like this. They were reclining. Don't you want to say, get off your rear end. The, the, the building's full. We need the room. But you, you know what they were? The Pharisees only think about themselves. I want my music and my program and my way or I'll leave. I love a revived church that says, there's the door. We're going we gonna, to we gonna, we gonna exalt Jesus. We don't exalt anybody else. Here's the problem. If you ever try to please people, you know what you're going to find? You can't please people anyway. I used to say this to my pastor. Now, think about this. A couple thousand people on Sunday morning. It's too cold in here. It's too hot in here. It's to this, it's to that. I used to say this. Church, I don't have a big family. I'm talking about my, my, my married life. I've got one wife, which is good if you're a Baptist practice. I've got one wife. <laughs> I've got one son. Now think of this. I've got one wife and one son. Is this true? And in our house, we can't get the temperature right. <laughs> I, I, there's just three people. One person, it's just right. The other person... Where's my sweater? It's cold. Other person, whoo, man, I'm losing weight sweating over here. <laughs> if you can't set the temperature correct for three people, you ain't got no hope with 2,000 people in the building, right? <laughs> and you would tell the person, you know what, the next week, same thing. It's just, you know why? Same reason those Pharisees were sprawled out and didn't care if you had a place to sit or not. Because the church works all about me. Jeff, I don't know if you know this, but those songs you sing ain't about Jesus, it's about what I want. And the first time you sing something I don't like, brother, I'll be emailing you. I'll be after you. I'll be coming after you. There, there, there's always people. I, I, I'm just being, why well, I'm telling you this? Because when the church gets a new passion and starts growing, you know, well, trouble's over. Shoo, no, it ain't. Because there's dying problems and growing problems. You want growing problems, but there's always some problems. Oh, old spiritual song said this. It's entitled, Let the Church Roll On. There's a woman in the church and she talks too much. What are we going to do? Let the church roll on. There's a singer in the church and he won't sing right. Tell me, what are we going to do? Let the church roll on. There's a deacon in the church and he don't deke right. 
What are we going to do? Let the church roll on. I pray you get a pastor that says, I'm hooked on Jesus, and the demons of Loganville won't take me off of Jesus. You know what will happen? It will upset demonic people. But you're going to see lives change every week. Why? There's no reason why. I, w this is not religious. This is just the government. When the government says Loganville ought to grow by 12.4%, which is already a big area, in the next five years, should we be reaching people? Absolutely. Uh, Georgia, which is considered a fast-growing state, is supposed to grow by 7.4, 7.3, whatever it's percent, 7.8, I think it is. That's great. But it's like, uh, hang on, that, that, that's, how, that's all of Georgia. Loganville is supposed to grow by 12.4%. That, that is an awesome part of growth. Uh, when Jesus is in the house, some people will respond to his power. Verse 2 and 12, we see that. I won't read verse 2 again. But, but that's exactly why so many people are gathered. That's the, if you ask these guys, why are you taking your friend? Because they would tell you why. Either I've seen the power that Jesus has or... I've heard all these stories of the power. And now, put yourself back in this day. And you're living in an area where you're beginning to hear things. For example, uh, you know, you go to Starbucks one day. A guy by on the other side of the table says, uh, man, I ain't never seen nothing like it. I've never seen a funeral like that. Well, what y'all know? Man, my, my second cousin, uh, Lazarus, died. And I was, I mean, the dude was dead four days. And a guy named Jesus shows up, and first we got upset because he said, remove the stone. And we're like, well, you know, Elijah's sister said, remove the stone. And I love how honest Scripture is. Been dead four days, he stinks. We don't remove no stone. This is another message about our planet. Anytime God wants to do something, somebody always tries to raise a stink. You, you, just, you just put that down. Always somebody saying, don't do it, it's going to stink. But I was there... And three words is all he said. Lazarus, come forth. And I'm going to tell you, like a mummy appeared at the entrance of him, wrapped with all those grave clothes. He's living today. Hey, you, you go somewhere else, you pop up Chick-fil-A, you're in line, and somebody says, beats all I've ever seen. Man, Bart Mace has been my next-door neighbor. The dude's been blind for 30 years. And, and, and some guy named Jesus simply stops and said, what do you need? I'd like to have my sight. And he says, let it be restored. My next door neighbor can see now. And then I think about all that. Let me give you one more. Here's a guy. I, I don't even know his name. But every once in a while I go down around the pool of Bethesda and there's a guy who for over 30 something years, I'm telling you, he can't walk. I saw him jogging this morning. Do you, do, you, do you, you understand? And so, how does faith come? You ever read enough scriptures to know how faith comes? Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the Word of God. And so, what happened is, you've got these people. Maybe, maybe, we don't know all the details. We don't know these guys' names. We don't know all that was wrong. We don't know. And by the way, I'll tell you something we don't know. For all we know, if you looked around those guys, one of those Men could have been somebody who got here. Uh, Lazarus could have been one of those guys saying, don't worry, saying, if he can help me, it's going to be easy with you. Come on, we'll just get you to Jesus. We, we, we don't know who they were. But we do know they knew, either from experience, either through sight, or because they heard, that if you get somebody to Jesus, and they're serious about Jesus, their life will be changed. And the last thing is this. Uh, when Jesus is in the house, some people respond to a changed life. I, I love the last verse. In fact, it's so good uh, that the last message, two more messages from now, we're going to preach a whole message on that verse. I love this. Those who showed up, their, their only explanation, their only thing they said, they just said, wow, I've never seen nothing like this. And I will tell you, I don't care of a church. My, one of my favorite pastors, he, he's been retired for about 15 years, passed away last week, John Bassanio, pastor First Base Houston. I watched it, thought so much of him that I made the time to see the, the seat on Facebook Live to see his funeral. 
Uh, First Baptist Houston this year probably has about a $40 million a year, but it's a huge church. By the way, it's a church where when the pastor preached, he preached like this. I mean, it was, he shouted. I mean, it was, it was, he, he would tell you. I mean, he would just tell you, we ain't no dead First Baptist church. I mean, that thing just grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. And, and I say that to say that when Jesus gets in the house, there's always that factor of wow. And I'm going to tell you about, about growing a church. He, the, the world calls it momentum. We just say God, it's God's favor. But the world, there's nothing wrong with the word momentum. It, it, they call it momentum. Let me tell you what I've discovered. If people stand in awe of God, can I tell you something? There ain't too much a church can do wrong. If people are not in awe of God, there ain't too much a church can do that's good. Well, what I'm saying is, when people get caught up with God and their, their experience is, wow. Somebody says, well, I'd rather have a different kind of music. They're so in all God, yeah, it may not be my favorite, it don't, it don't matter. God's moving, don't worry about it. Well, when people, when people stand in awe of God and say, wow, and somebody leaves saying, I ain't been church in 20 years, I ain't know, I ain't know they didn't wear suits and ties anymore, I might not have come to church. And other person says, ah, this style's time, I'm not, wor- I'm not worried about any of that. And, 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 and these people, I mean the ones who, we're going to be moved of God. Not the Pharisees. Most of these Pharisees are never going to get it. And, and by the way, that's something you've got to learn. You, you don't convince everybody. Jesus didn't win everybody. Not everybody loved Jesus. Jesus got crucified on the cross. Uh, that's just the way it is. Uh, we don't know who he's going to reach, who he's not going to reach. Uh, they have to make a decision. Our job is to preach it, love folks, pray. Uh, but my point is, uh, when Jesus is in the house, these things happen. And some people, just, they, they, they see a change. There are folks who won't believe anything. Until you start putting out chairs because the room's too full. And then, they, and, then, and then some folks who are a little bit hard-hearted, they'll be like, huh, it's like God's doing something. And these people who, I promise you, did not know near the theology about Jesus that we do. I mean, they, if we could pop in the Mark 2 and say, you think this is impressive? Oh, wait till you see the empty tomb. You think this is impressive? Wait till you, and we name some miracles that hasn't even happened. You think this is awesome? Wait till the book of Romans is written and Paul begins to tell you some things about what this means as far as grace and all the implications of the theology of, this, of the fact that this man can forgive sin. I love what Jesus does. You know, he's just, he's just arguing about who you, you that forgive sin. Jesus says, let me ask you a question. I think it's easier to talk a lot or to do. I guess it's easier to do something. Well, in that case, rise up! And the man rises. It's hard to argue, isn't it, with the changed life. So I don't believe in this, don't believe in that. But when a person says, all I know is I was a drunk and God delivered. All I know is my marriage was in, about in divorce court. God delivered. All I know is the church was empty. God, 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 God said, all I know is I woke up every morning frustrated, empty, suicidal, whatever it is you've got. All I know is is that Jesus stepped in and did what only God can do. And to show you this, read John chapter 9. Uh, there's a blind man. It's the only time we actually know that this happened. It may have happened uh, before, but we don't know. Uh, John 9, there's a man who was blind. It tells us from his birth. And the Pharisees are trying to argue with him. And here's a guy who has no theological training, and the Pharisees cannot shake him off the fact, because all the man says was, I don't know all you know. All I know is this. I was blind. The record indicates it. And I can see the day. You know what they did? Get him out of here. You, you can't deal with the guy who won't get off his testimony. <laughs> hey, let me end by saying this. I've said this before, and I, I, I'll say it again but sometime in the next few weeks probably. Well, what do you do to get Jesus in the house? And I'm just going to plant this. I'm going to preach on it. Uh, three quick things. First of all, you show up. What does that mean? You just show wherever God wants you. You just show up. In, in other words, I don't, I don't, I don't come to some of the day and say, "Let me stick my finger in the air. Which way is the wind blowing?" Well, Lord, I'm going to preach seventy percent with energy today. But once you grow another forty people, that that that's nonsense. You show up. If I'm a greeter, I show up. Well, you know, once a big crowd comes out, I show up. If I'm teaching Sunday school, whether it's five people or 50 people, it doesn't matter who's there, I'm going to show up and do what God's called me to do. If, if I'm a singer, which I'm not, but if I'm a singer, I'm going to sing. And I'm going to sing my best, and I know they do. I'm going to sing my best 
whether there's empty chairs or standing room. You see where I'm going with this. You, you show up. Because a lot of times what we do is we say, well, I'm not serving God today, but, you know, if God will do these three things and these five things happen and this happens, this happens. The problem with that is this. Jesus says, unless you're faithful with a little, I don't make you master over much. The second thing is this. Not only we show up, but we grow up. You know what that means? It, it, it means I'm human, and I've got to protect my heart. I, I, I can't show up and say things like, well, you know, so-and-so, I don't, they're my next-door neighbor. I don't think they always live for Jesus, but they come to church every week. Uh, well, you know, my, my favorite program has been canceled. Well, I tell you, I just can't hardly... I, I, I know folks in Scripture were thrown in dungeon, fed to the lion, drowned, soared asunder, Hebrews 11 says. I get it. But that burn summit done cancel my favorite program. I just can't wonder if I can survive now. And that's how we live. I'm going to grow up. You know what it means? It means I'm going to shake all this apathy and bitterness and anger off. Because first of all, it don't hurt nobody but you. Because the world's going to keep on spinning. The day. I used to tell my churches, because I did so many funerals, I used to tell churches, it, 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 and this was even said with Dr. Pisano's funeral. I mean, you know, a few thousand people were there. Things, awesome funeral, by the way. Two different people in the choir. And the pastor who's there now said, don't worry, we got one more song, and we're coming back to eat some fried chicken. And everybody started, you know, laughing. I used to tell my church, it's true. And it's, it, if you don't know this, it's true. When you die, when I die, hopefully, now it, may, it may not happen, hopefully there'll be somebody crying and say, well, we're going to miss it. But can I tell you something? I saw it. It don't matter if it's the mayor, the governor. It don't matter if it's the former athlete. It don't matter if it's the guy who gave a million dollars to the church over 30 years. Once we get back in the graveside, we eat fried chicken and mashed potatoes and pass me an extra dessert if you can. <laughs> what I'm saying is, some of you are like this. I, I, I'm promising you, when, when, if you've ever been to the cemetery in a busy area, when you're out there, they, they don't shut down Highway 78. There's still, you ever notice that? that? There's still cars going. You ever notice that? That's just where life is. Because life is not about you. We come and go. It's about God. And so I show up, but I grow up. I finally realize, you know, the main player in life is Jesus. You ever know, if you thought this being in the service, you know, it's everything we've done, we prayed. Did we pray in the Southern Baptist name? You ever know, from the prayer to the songs to the message, everything's about Jesus. Well, why, why didn't we preach this? We're going to talk about when money's in the house. When money comes and goes. By the way, you get Jesus in the house, you'd be surprised money, how money follows. Uh, well, when, when, when talent's in the house. Listen, you get Jesus in the house, you'll be surprised at how choir grows and Sunday school grows. And I, just, I mean, the main player is Jesus. So, so I show up, I grow up, I just look up. That's Hebrews 12. We look unto Jesus. In other words, I just keep focusing on Jesus. Why? Because the world is a fallen place. Not everybody likes Jesus. There's Pharisees. There's, uh, there's always Pharisees around Jesus. There's always legalism. Pharisees around people who follow Jesus. I have a tendency. Maybe you do. Maybe you don't. I get my eyes on the Pharisees. I get discouraged. I don't do that. So I just keep my eyes on Jesus. And hopefully there comes a day where people respond in a positive way to the gospel. And hopefully there comes a day when we leave services where hey, you run into a former, how's it going? How's it going? Whoa, Jesus was in the house today. What will bother some of them, by the way, because they, you know, there are always people who are watching. They're, the best news they can hear is, we're about to go under. I knew you would. And the worst news some people can hear is, whoa, man, finances back up, excitement's back up. And listen, I don't think I've ever loved Jesus. I'll tell you this is true in my life. I, 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 as far as I know, I've never been more in love with Jesus than I am right now. And I hope if I'm alive six months, a year, 20 years from now, because of circumstances, the economy, whoever the president is. Listen, I love Jesus with President Trump being up there. I loved him just as much with President Obama. I loved him just as much with Bush. It doesn't matter who's up there. Are you with me? It doesn't matter. If his eyes on the throne or he dies. I'm going to pursue Jesus. If Pilate's the king, I'm going to preach Jesus. If someone else is the king, you're going to preach it. If the Roman Empire is in control and it's illegal, let's preach Jesus. If it's not illegal, let's preach him anyway. You understand where I'm going with this? Everything in life centers around the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Jesus gets in the house, oh man. I'm telling you, when Jesus gets in the house, you'll wake up on Monday morning saying, oh, I wish it was Sunday. You get up on Tuesday, oh, I can't. 
I just can't wait. Listen, when Jesus gets in the house, I'll say something, I'll, I'll pray. Jesus gets in the house, you know what happens? If you're a staff member, you get where folks will come up to you, and they're embarrassed. Oh, Pat, Pat, Pastor Steve, uh, two weeks from now I'm on vacation. You, I won't be. Oh, man, you get on vacation. Then they'll say, I know, but I just don't want to miss what I know is going to happen here. And I walked away from those conversations thinking, we got you. We got you. Because you, you, you don't even want to miss for something as important as a family vacation, which they did, and it's good to do. What they were saying is, Jesus is showing up. In fact, I heard this all the time. I'm just afraid the Sunday I miss is a Sunday that special revival breaks out. And I'm like, I understand. Just wherever you are, just keep on praying. But when Jesus is in the house, people respond to who he is. And some, in fact, most respond in a positive way. Youth groups grow, children grow, young couples grow, people get back. I mean, just all type, all type of great and awesome things happen. On every head, bow every eyes closed. We're going to have a time of invitation. Uh, maybe you're here today and you've not met this Jesus we're talking about. You know, when the man was healed, he not only was healed physically, he actually got saved. Your faith has made you whole is a unusual Greek phrase that means you were made whole physically but also made whole spiritually. His faith led him to salvation. And maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus. Listen, I, I went to church a long time growing up and in my mind I knew him but I 